Please, please pray with me, brothers and sisters. Holy Spirit of God, take our minds and think through them. Take these words and speak through them and set our hearts on fire for love of thee. Amen. Please be seated. I think it's been over a year since I highlighted my Aunt Jean's pecan, famous pecan pie in our, a daily word. Daily words, for those of you that haven't signed up for them, are uh, meditations written by the clergy that are posted or sent to your email Monday through Friday uh, throughout the year to start your day, to help you start your day a little bit with some inspiration. So if you are not on those, go to the website. Those are joining us online, go to the website. There's almost on every bottom of every page a way that you can sign up for the Daily Word. But a year ago, I spoke about my Aunt Jean's famous pecan pie. That pie was a Cox family staple at all of our holiday meals, causing everyone to inquire whether or not Jean would be bringing her pie before they agreed to attend and contribute their meager, in comparison, their meager offering. After Aunt Jean's husband died, I tried to find opportunities to get to Dallas and visit my lonely aunt. On one such trip, I thought it would be a good idea if she imparted to me the secrets behind the making of her famous pie. Now, it's important that I give you full disclosure. It was well known in my immediate family that I am pretty much a doofus in the kitchen. But Aunt Jean was tickled at the idea of being in the kitchen and handing down the skill that was so appreciated by her family. She was going to give me a master class on making pecan pie. Now the good news, for me at least, was that Aunt Jean actually had a written recipe for the pie. Most of your intergenerational fa family favorite dishes don't have those, do they? Most of them talk about take a bunch of flour, join it with a pinch of this and a dash of that, and boom, you've got it, right? Something as easy as that. Emboldened by the security of having her pull out a dog-eared recipe full of stains from decades of pie making, I remember thinking, this is going to be easy. And maybe pulling together all the ingredients of the filling was, but I failed to realize the nuances required in making her pie crust. The texture of the butter, not margarine, just butter, the texture of the butter has to be just right. Don't let it sit out too long. Room temperature is lethal for her pie crust. Aunt Jean didn't use those newfangled food processors, nope. Into the flour, she cut in small pieces of the butter by hand with a fork, not some fancy pastry tool, but with a fork, until she had kind of a mealy mesh texture, adding a little bit of cold water along the way, but not too much. Plenty of flour was required to, oh, it needed to be chilled. I almost forgot that. It, it needed to be chilled, but not too long. Plenty of flour was required to roll out the dough, but another one of Aunt Jean's secret weapons was just how she rolled the dough. I mean, she wheeled that rolling pin like it was a jiu-jitsu knife. Try as I might, I wasn't able to figure out how to describe or jot down her method of rolling out the dough. And for years after that master class, I was reminded that the secret was in her details. The exact chill of the butter, not over mixing the flour and the butter in a little bit of water, chilling the dough for just the right amount of time and making magic with that rolling pin. 
In our gospel reading today, the master is giving his disciples and us a master class on prayer. Throughout the gospels, especially in Luke, Jesus is often found in prayer, particularly in and around the major events of his ministry, like his baptism, the calling of the disciples, feed, the feeding of the 5,000, the transfiguration, Gethsemane, and even on the cross, he prayed. Jesus is a master of prayer. Prayer is literally woven into the fabric of his life. And he expects prayer to be an integral part of his followers' lives. The disciples are paying attention, observing him in prayer, and ask if Jesus could teach them to pray. All the rabbis, the teachers, the masters, even John the Baptist taught their followers how to pray. As you probably know, what we now call the Lord's Prayer is only found in Matthew's and, and Luke's Gospels. With Matthew's version, the longer of the two, and has been used since the earliest days of the church, almost word for word in its worship. Many believe what Jesus gave us in these passages is a formulary for prayer. Yes, a prayer itself, but an outline of prayer's major components in brief, especially in this shorter version that was just read by Jill from Luke. Maybe I'm the only one, but sometimes we seem to pray this prayer almost on autopilot moving on to the next prayer or action in our worship without allowing the words to season within us or resonate with the details of our lives. So let's dig a little deeper this morning into Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. If you want to follow along in your service booklet, it's on page 11. It begins with Father. Father, a call, an imperative, a call upon God, a call of devotion, of relationship. Addressing God as Father was an innovation by Jesus. The Hebrew scriptures compare God as being like a father, but Jesus goes further by claiming God as Father and addressing God as Father. This address reveals something of God's nature. For Jesus is not just saying this, calling him Father because he is the Son of God. By calling him Father, Jesus also attributes to God the authority and love that is given by humans to their earthly father. This characterization reveals something of Jesus' nature and of humans' nature. We are dependent upon our Heavenly Father. Next up in his outline for prayer, Jesus says, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Reflecting both the Hebrews' recognition of God's holiness and the admonition received in Leviticus that you are holy, God says. You are holy, for I am holy. Hallowing God's name brings us into reverent conversation with God, knowing that the only way in which we can become holy is through relationship with God, experienced in prayer, experienced in worship with others, and experienced in service to God. The final attribution or praise given to God is when Jesus says, Your kingdom come. In doing so, he is calling upon the reign of God, which began with his own coming and yet remains to this day merely partial, not yet fully completed. When we pray these words, we continue to invite the coming of God into the very details of our lives today and each day. 
as well as calling for the return of Christ and of God's kingdom being brought to fruition. In praying this, we believe this is God's work and will take place in God's time. But until then, use us, dear Father. Use us in bringing to life your kingdom here and now, we pray. So far, the ingredients of Jesus' prayer are that God has been acknowledged and addressed as our parent, whose holiness is praised, and who is recognized as the one whose reign we submit to in our lives now and in the future. Jesus then makes three requests. First, by asking, give us each day our daily bread. The request for bread, when heard by his earliest listeners, caused them to hearken back to their exodus face, faith when God supplied quails and manna sufficient for each day. Food in antiquity was not a thing to be taken for granted. For the vast majority of the population there, they had daily anxiety whether or not there would be enough food for their households or for their families. This appeal to our Heavenly Father is made so as to be freed from this daily anxiety, but it also reflects a great trust in the providence of God in all things. God has and will continue to meet our most basic needs. Next, Jesus gives recognition that we consistently fall short from what is expected from God's children. And it is God who has the power to redeem and pardon. And for those who have been forgiven much, our response be, should be to forgive others for the abundance of forgiven, forgiveness given to us. Finally, Jesus' last request is to be kept from trial, from being tested beyond our ability to withstand capitulation to the basis, our basis of instincts or the influences of others. Spare us, dear Father. Spare us from anything that will keep us from questioning our dependence upon you and trusting you in all things. Like the recipe card for my Aunt Jean's pecan pie, Jesus has given us the essential ingredients for prayer. While it includes specific requests for God's attention, prayer is less a shopping list and is designed more to shape us into fully living as God's children, dependent and trusting, casting all of our daily anxieties upon him seeking not the best for ourselves alone, but for others as well, all the while, all the while, humbly acknowledging that we are aware of our limits and failures and the depth of our need for God. Despite the master class she gave me, I never mastered my Aunt Jean's pecan pie. She gave me the details of the recipe and demonstrated the subtleties of making the pie crust. But it required more of me than I gave to it. I needed to make the pie on a regular basis, not just once every two or three years. To learn the nuances of trusting the recipe and knowing the proper use and texture of the basic ingredients or the right touch of that rolling pin, I, I needed more practice. I needed to be in the hot kitchen more, setting aside the time to feel the texture of the dough, waiting for it to pac waiting patiently for it to chill and with sleeves rolled up, throwing my whole self into rolling out the dough into a worthy crust to hold the sweetness of the filling. 
so too a life of sweet prayer. It must be practiced. To weave prayer into our life as did Jesus, to approach having his same level of intimacy with the Father means bringing God into all the minute and mundane aspects of our lives. To start our day and end our day with prayer is a start, but it is akin to my making pies only every two or three years and expecting to create a masterpiece each time. No, to pray like Jesus, we need more than Jesus' words. We need to pay attention. See how we can weave God into the busyness of our day. See when we can insert time to ask God to be present with us, guiding, enlightening, and filling us with his spirit. Through these words we call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gives us not just a prayer we should mechanically recite but the essential ingredients of how to communicate with God, our Father. For it is in that communication that God, our Father, forms us into his children, maturing in wisdom and more and more reflecting our Heavenly Father. It is up to us to invest the time in the hot kitchen of our lives and of our faith to grow and see the evidence of God's great generosity and all that we have, all that we have, and all that we do. Amen.